It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Joining me today in our Baltimore studios is the Green Party vice presidential nominee, Adamu Baraka. He has for four decades fought for our human rights right here in the U.S., not to mention the world over. Thanks for joining me today, Mr. Baraka. It's my pleasure to be here. So, Mr. Baraka, when we think of human rights, we normally think of the rest of the world, Haiti, some of the poorer nations, uh, India, and, uh, of course, right now, the crisis in Syria and so forth. We don't think about it in terms of the human rights violations right here in the United States. And you've spent many decades fighting for those rights. Tell us about why you have focused on that. Well, as your uh, question indicates, when most people think of human rights and human rights violations, they tend to think of those things happening outside of the U.S. But we know that that is not uh, uh, true, that the U.S. is involved and has been involved in numerous human rights issues and violations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, people in this country, its own citizens, uh, but of course worldwide. So what we have been doing for the last few decades is operating from the uh, 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 radical perspective uh, provided by the uh, work of people like uh, uh, W.B. Du Bois and Malcolm X, who understood that uh, the human rights framework was a framework that was relevant to, to us in this country, and African Americans in particular. Uh, we have been shining a light on the U.S. Uh, we have said that it has, to, it has to be one standard for all nations. So we have been applying international human rights standards uh, and laws uh, to the behavior of the U.S. state domestically and internationally, but primarily domestically. Uh, and that was the basis of the work that we did in, in uh, developing the U U.S. Human Rights Network, which was the first network of organizations committed to applying human rights standards to the U.S. Now, give me some examples of the kinds of issues you have worked uh, on in the U.S. Mm. Uh, the death penalty, for example, of uh, the uh, ever-present uh, state violence directed at uh, uh, not only African Americans, but other uh, minority populations here in this country, uh, the mass incarceration industry here in this country, of uh, the systematic uh, uh, non-recognition of the human right to uh, things like water, uh, health care, uh, all of the economic, social, uh, and cultural rights, education, um, these are all rights that we are supposed to have, but this state does not recognize those rights. So part of what we have been doing is not just dealing with those particular issues, but also educating uh, people in this country on the fact that they have these objective human rights uh, that the U.S. state does not um, let them know about. So uh, every issue one can imagine, from the environment to uh, to the right to, to, uh, to leisure, to have time off, uh, we have worked on here uh, in this country. When it comes to specific issues, let's take the Detroit water crisis yes. and the right to clean water is something that is internationally secured by the UN. Um, and yet here, right in the United States, the greatest, the richest country in the world, um, has a problem in terms of making sure that the water that people are getting from their taps are clean and free of uh, the harmful um, uh, material yes. that has put our children at risk. Um, what's the problem with this kind of international policy that's not uh, fully uh, uh, endorsed and embraced by uh, the governments of this uh, great country? Mm. Well, actually, uh, interesting enough, the, when I was actually running the U.S. Human Rights Network, uh, we were the ones instrumental in bringing the Special Rapporteur to the U.S. Uh, to deal with this issue of the right to water and sanitation. Um, and so that's been one of the efforts that we were engaged in to, uh, to reframe uh, that issue, to reframe it as, in fact, a human rights issue. So the fact that we have people in these large uh, metropolitan areas uh, who are not uh, allowed or who don't have access to uh, clean water um, uh, threatens their, their health, uh, threatens the health of the entire community, threatens the health, really, of the entire country. So we have raised that as an issue and is an example of the kinds of issues that uh, uh, should be 
uh, reframe uh, into the human rights framework that they really uh, are. And uh, when you take the International Convention on uh, Cultural and Political Rights um, and the way in which the, uh, uh, the uh, Black Power Movement or the Black Lives Matter Movement is expressing itself today in this country, um, uh, which is guarded by this uh, convention, um, how, do you, how do you see communicating with the public to inform that what, what Black Lives are doing and what the, the uh, former Black Power Movement had done in this country are within their internationally protected rights? Well, you know, that, that is part of the reframing. That's part of the, the redefinition of, of the work of social justice here in this country, that the, uh, the, the social justice uh, and human rights and the movement for pro-democracy are all interrelated. Uh, in fact, they are part of the broader human rights framework, uh, what we call the people-centered human rights framework. So that uh, perspective, that language is what informs um, most of the radical movement here in this country, in particular with, with black folks. So you see that, uh, for example, the uh, movement for black lives and the Black Lives Matter folks have all embraced and are using uh, human rights language. And that's a good thing because not only does it reframe the issues in the U.S., but it connects them to the entire world. Because uh, we know that the human rights framework um, is the language of social justice uh, that's used uh, around the world. So that's part of that, in, that, that connection, part of that uh, traditional uh, black internationalism, if you will, uh, that has been part of our movement here uh, in, in this country. Uh, so, you know, that reframing is important. Uh, more people understanding that they, in fact, have uh, rights beyond just the Constitution is important because even issues related to, to immigration and the rights of, of migrant workers, you know, we have the framing of those issues within the context of of U.S. Uh, constitutional law, but there's a whole host of laws, uh, human rights laws and standards that apply to those issues. But uh, the, the uh, social movements, uh, legislators, are not really that familiar with the, the uh, integral nature of, of that framework. Therefore, they don't appeal to it. So what we've been trying to do over the years is to make more and more people aware of this framework so they can use that in their uh, agitation and advocacy work and organizing work. Now, Baraka, just a few nights ago, uh, you spent the night right across the street here uh, at the healthcare for the homeless. And uh, this is a huge problem in this country, homelessness, not only for the people that you slept with, but also for many inner city uh, populations, and including an issue for the returning veterans in this country who are uh, you know, uh, not assisted in terms of resettling in the country and having sh basic shelter. Um, how do you, in the Green Party, plan to address this problem? Well, we are, that is one of, one of, one of the issues that we plan to focus on if we, in fact, win. Um, it is a, uh, a shame that we have uh, more than a half a million people uh, in this country uh, who every night don't know where they're going to lay their head that evening. Uh, so the uh, fact that we have uh, hundreds of thousands of individuals who are walking the streets of the city uh, is something that we have to address. Uh, we believe and embrace the human rights framework and the right to housing is a fundamental right. So we are going to uh, ensure that we have sufficient resources uh, from the federal level directed toward addressing this issue. Uh, we're going to try to persuade uh, state and local governments to get serious about this issue. The fact that uh, not only are they not uh, uh, seriously addressing the issue of homelessness in terms of providing shelters, uh, the response for, for many of these uh, local governments has been to further criminalize homelessness, which means they are criminalizing poverty by these sweeps uh, by uh, these draconian uh, laws that if you lay down and then you put a, a cover over yourself, then you are basically camping, therefore you are subject to arrest. So this kind of, of shameless behavior on the part of local governments, the neglect we have from the state, uh, we're, we're going to address that. You know, having a chance to spend one night, and it's only one night, um, 
really was an eye opener in terms of looking at what people have to go through on a, on a nightly basis. Um, I mean, just in the first three hours, we had uh, a drug overdose right, right there where we were at. Uh, and then two hours later, um, there was a raid from some bounty hunters looking for someone and they came through and started ripping up people's tents uh, looking for this individual, not respecting the, uh, the rights and the property of, of folks who are forced to live on the streets. Um, this is the reality that people face uh, every evening. We talk to people who have been on the streets for years, 13 years, six years, four years, you know, uh, and, and that's their new reality. But most of us in this country, we see people who are homeless and we look away. Uh, but when you have a chance to spend time and to listen to their stories, uh, and you understand the issues, and you understand the neglect from the state, uh, it is something that will re really motivate one to want to really uh, spend a lot more time and energy uh, to do away with this backward uh, practice. General Barakai, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. <laughs>